Welcome to the Great Connections Podcast. We're your hosts, Marsha Familaro Enright and Liz Parker. In this podcast, we aim to talk about powerful ideas and practices that will aid you to achieving the best in your life and live as a free person, like the ones we use in the Great Connections seminars. Visit thegreatconnections.org for more information on our in-person programs and where you can subscribe and comment on the podcast, where you can find links and resources as well as our email address. We'd love to hear from you. In this episode, we're going to talk about violence on campuses. Why are we seeing so much of it? And why in academia? And what does it tell us about what's going on in our culture at large? We're going to discuss the basic beliefs of postmodernism and how uh, philosophy and ideas are really responsible for this situation that we're in today and where alternative opinions are shouted down and people who diverge from the intellectual majority are disinvited or attacked. Stay tuned and enjoy. Recently, I listened to an exchange on Bill Maher's show between commentator and neuroscientist um, Sam Harris and Ben Affleck on Islamism, I mean on Islamists, and I thought it was a great example of what's going on these days with ideological disagreement, you know, and, and what's going on on campus, because Affleck started accusing Harris of being a racist. Here's a clip. Yeah, well, liberals have really failed on the topic of theocracy. They, they, they'll, they'll criticize white theocracy. They'll criticize right. Christians. They'll still get agitated over the abortion clinic bombing that happened in 1984. But when, <laughs> when you want to talk about the treatment of women and homosexuals and free thinkers and, and public intellectuals in the Muslim world, uh, I would argue that li liberals have failed us. And uh, the crucial point of confusion, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank, thank God you're here. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the crucial point of confusion is that, that we have been sold this meme of Islamophobia where every criticism of the doctrine of Islam gets conflated with bigotry toward Muslims as people. Right. And that is uh, it's, it's intellectually ridiculous. So, even it gets so hold on, are racist. you the person who understands the officially codified doctrine of Islam? You're uh, the interpreter well, of that, well, so you well, can say, well, I, this I'm, is... I'm, I think actually, any, I'm actually well-educated well, on this topic. I'm, yeah. I'm asking you. So I mean, you're you, saying, if I criticize, the, you're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something... It, well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it no, really no, isn't. I, I'm not denying not, that, that certain people are bigoted against Muslims as people. That's, right. And that's a that's problem. big of you. But the... But why are you so hostile to, about this it's, concept? It's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. Hostile. It's but it's so nuts. It's so. It's like saying it's those so not your shifty Jew. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what well, we are saying. You guys are saying but, if you want to be liberals, believe in liberal principles right. like freedom of speech, like right. um, you know we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an inalienable life, like all men are created no. equal. No, Ben, we have to be able to criticize bad ideas. And of course we do. Islam, no liberal doesn't okay, want to okay. criticize bad ideas. But Islam but at why this moment when, is the mother load of bad ideas. Jesus. So we have we have ideas like blasphemy. It is it's a, an ugly apostasy. It is basic. You're trying to say that these few people, that's all the problem is, these few bad apples. The idea that someone should be killed if they leave mu the that's Islamic... That's horrible. That should okay. Wait, wait. That, that but wait, you're saying that the idea that Islam. someone should be killed if they leave the Islamic religion is just a few bad apples? The people who would actually believe in an act that you murder somebody if they yes. leave Islam yes. is not the majority of Muslims at all. Okay, okay but is it? Let, let me let me you, break you, this you down for you. Okay, we have it, as, you, as you say, we have 1.5, 1.6 billion mm -hmm. Muslims. Now, second biggest religion in the world, a quarter. Well, Ben, let me let me unpack this. Let me unpack this for you. Please do. Um, we have so, the, 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 just up. imagine some concentric circles here. You have at the center, you have jihadists. These are people who wake up in the morning. Wanting to kill apostates, wanting to, to die trying. They believe in paradise. They Horrible, believe, bad they believe people in, that, in, yeah. in martyrdom. Outside of them, we have Islamists. These are these are people who are just as convinced of martyrdom and paradise, and and wanting to to foist their religion on the rest of humanity. But they want to work within the system. They're not going to blow themselves up on a bus. They want to change governments. They want to use democracy against itself. That it, that those two circles 
arguably are 20 percent of the Muslim world. Okay, this is this is not what the fringe of the fringe. What are you basing that research on? A, a bunch of poll results that we can talk about. So, uh, to, to give you one point of contact, 78 percent of British Muslims think that the Danish cartoonists should have been prosecuted. 78 percent. So I'm being conservative when I roll this back to 20 percent. But outside of that circle, you have conservative Muslims who. Are, can can write can honestly look at ISIS and say that that does not represent us we're, that we're horrified by that, but they hold views about human rights and about women and about homosexuals that are deeply troubling. So so they, these are not Islamists, they're not jihadists, but they but they both those they, are the views are great divine. Ours. And, but, and, and but, the, but they, they also keep women and, and homosexuals immiserated in these cultures, and we have to empower the true reformers in the Muslim world yeah. to, to change it. And, oh, what, and but, lying about the, the, the link yeah, between okay. doctrine let, let and, and behavior then, is not yeah. going to do that. A lot but of the, talk. The, the, well, so, what is your solution? Oh, the what is your ask? No, just the, 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 the solution, the solution, no, 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 the solution to, is very to, to much what we've killed more Muslims than they've killed no, us by not, an awful lot. We've we invaded need, more Muslims. I am not for more killing. An awful lot. And yet somehow we're exempted you know, from okay. these things because they're not really right. a reflection of a, what you know, we believe in. We did by accident. That's why we invaded we're Iraq. Not, okay. Okay. Million we're people not convincing anybody. It's not that. I'm specifically telling you that I disagree with what you think. I don't actually understand my argument. And we're obviously not convincing anybody of the year. If you don't understand my argument, your argument. And it's like, agreement. you know, black people, you know, they show no, each no, other. That is not my argument. No, it's not. It's based no. on facts. I can show you a pew poll of Egyptians. They are not outliers in the Muslim world that say like 90% of them believe death is the appropriate response to leaving the religion. If 90% of Brazilians thought that death was the appropriate response yeah. to leaving Catholicism, yeah. you would think it was a bigger deal. I would think it's a big deal no matter what. No okay, matter what. but that's the fact. You don't. But what in I wouldn't do is say it's all Brazilians, or I wouldn't say, well, Ted Bundy did this. God damn, these gays are all trying to eat each other. You know? there, okay, let, let me just give you what you want. There are hundreds of millions of Muslims who are nominal Muslims, who don't take the faith seriously, who don't want to kill apostates, who are horrified by ISIS, and we need to defend these people prop them up and let them reform Dude, you're right. talking, I ISIS like couldn't fill a double-A ballpark in Charleston, West Virginia, and you were making a career no, out of no. ISIS, ISIS, ISIS. But no, 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 no it's not no, just no, ISIS. Not. It's, it's the all jihadists. It's global, it's a phenomenon it's of global jihad. I, I think that's the opposite there, of There, there is those things. There's ISIS, there's global jihadists. The question is the degree to which you're willing to say, because I've witnessed this behavior, which we all object to on the part of these people, it's I'm willing to flatly condemn not, those of you I don't know and have never met. No, this is not condemning people, it's ideas. Well, it sounds like Affleck is the one who's making these blanket statements about Harris, but it's really uncomfortable to watch, and it's really stressful to listen to. Actually, when I was watching this whole interview, I was experiencing all this discomfort from just seeing how Affleck was responding to it and treating Harris, and like how he was even listening to Harris's statements. Or not listening. I mean, in, in my opinion... Harris is very measured and reasonable in what he's saying about Islam. So I think the racism charge is unfounded. Yeah, I think you're right. He was not listening at all to Sam's reasons. And Sam Harris, he even brings up these poll numbers and says, well, yes, I'm really educated about this. And there are these studies and these numbers and statistics. And I think he even tries to give Islam the benefit of the doubt and being conservative in his numbers. And I think he's also addressing Affleck's concerns about, yes, there are these, a multitude of people who are peaceful and I'm not making a blanket statement about them, but I'm just saying that this is a reason to be concerned. But Affleck doesn't seem to think these numbers or his statements really mean anything. He's not really listening or responding to those statements. And he just says that Sam Harris is making a blanket statement about all Muslims and that that's totally racist. But and even when Harris is talking, Affleck is not even looking at him. Um, he's interrupting him. He can't look him in his face. He's just like totally distressed. He's like rubbing his face and he's so emotional. He's so disturbed by what Harris is saying, but then doesn't seem to actually respond exactly to the statements that Harris makes and to the reasons that Harris is giving for his beliefs. Because Harris does talk about, you know, empowering the true reformers of the Muslim world. And he is in agreement with Affleck that, you know, he isn't, that he doesn't want to condemn all these people who, who really do want to, um, you know, live rightfully, but 
Affleck just seems to ignore this proportion problem and not really listen to the reasons why Harris is concerned, but it seems really childish and really disrespectful. Um, and I just think about like, if I'm in dialogue with somebody and then if they treated me like that, I think I would be, feel really disrespected. Um, and I think it's the sense of moral righteousness that Affleck has on his part that, well, he can just shut Harris down because he's a racist and why should we listen to a racist anyways? Who cares what they have to say? He doesn't have any ground to talk and we shouldn't pay attention to what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. Affleck is so incredibly condescending, you know. Well, you know, at the same time, he's being entirely emotional and not listening to the facts and reasoning at all. He, frankly, he's using what we call in logic the argument ad hominem, which is against the man. In other words, attack the person, not the ideas they're talking about, and try to try to undermine the argument by saying this person is a bad person. Because he, he doesn't really seem to understand Harris's ideas at all. You know, and the thing is, usually when you can't attack the ideas of a person, when you don't feel capable of that, it implies that the person using our argument, argument ad hominem doesn't have enough evidence to attack the arguments, so they attack the person. It's kind of like the easy way out. And as you noticed, he's very emotionally hijacked. He can't even listen to what Harris is saying. So I have to ask myself, what is the mo motivation to feel like that? Um, wh why is something s so threatening? Is there something so threatening of his core values or his beliefs that he becomes emotionally hijacked? These charges of racism against people with opposing views, I, I think, if you really look at them, they go back to the epistemological claims of postmodernism. And th those ideas are so deep, that's why it becomes a, an it becomes a threat to, if people are holding um, postmodernist beliefs, it becomes a, a, a threat to their very core beliefs, and that's why they get emotionally hijacked. Uh, in my, uh, you know, in the explanation I'm going to give about why it's epistemological claims, I'm not saying Affleck is conscious about all of these issues. He may not only know that to criticize Muslims at all is racist, and he's uncomfortable with that situation. So what what I want to say about it is mostly about the ideas of postmodernist theorists and the consequences of those ideas. Yeah, I think that, like Affleck, we're uncomfortable making blanket statements and judgments about large groups of people. But I think Sam Harris was also in agreement with that. But what he was trying to say, it's not the people that we are talking about it's the ideas and I think that's kind of the issue where they couldn't find ground to talk but you said that this kind of argumentation was caused by epistemological claims of postmodernism and first I was just wondering what is epistemology and what is postmodernism and what are its epistemological claims yeah, I know those are kind of uh, pretty abstract and arcane topics to be bringing up and words to be bringing up, so they ought to be clarified. Well, epistemology is the study of how do we know things? What mental tools do we use? What is a fact? When do we have enough evidence to think something's true? Um, things like, well, what's the correct way to form ideas and what principles should you use to have uh, evidence-based and rationally based arguments? What's the form of an argument in a sentence, or in logic it's called a proposition? Issues like that. That's what epistemology studies and concerns itself with. And postmodernism is a philosophical system that basically opposes every position of the Enlightenment. Or, in other words, every position resulting from the belief that there is a reality that humans can know through reasoning. Now, the Enlightenment was a period from the 17th to the 19th centuries called the Age of Reason, and it led to tremendous scientific advancements. It led to the Industrial Revolution, and it led to the founding of the United States. Basically, it led to modernity. Postmodernism counters everything about that period. It holds that it's impossible to speak meaningfully about a reality that exists independently of what human beings have in their minds. Now, I don't know if you can get your mind wrapped around that, but 
basically it doesn't think that there's that there's a reality to know there's only what we think about things so epistemologically or how do we come up with what we know they say all we know is a creation of social consensus of what people agree with to believe with each other and and basically if it's really based on social consensus it comes down to what the majority thinks if you think about it so ironically this belief that knowledge is based on social consensus makes it epistemologically very tyrannical it says this is the rule of the majority ethically they think that we can't have individual identity or autonomy but we're all just a part of some group a group of race class sex on and on and more groups are invented every day they don't believe you can create your own personality or character who you are or what you believe about yourself you have no power you know have no power to get around this social experience that determines who you are and because of the group that you're in and the consequence of that is politically they think that it's all a matter of groups struggling for power and moreover being anti-reason and anti-individualism these people are also anti-science anti-technology anti-market as causing repression of the victim groups of the underprivileged groups since they think it's all a power struggle now there's a great little book about this theory called explaining postmodernism from Rousseau to Foucault by philosophy professor Stephen Hicks and it's it's so powerful and clarifying that it's been translated into six languages we'll put a link to it on our, our resource page but uh, back to epistemology because it's key you see, I want to be clear. It's not that most modernists think that it's really hard to acquire the truth, that reasoning objectively is difficult, that there are many, many things we have trouble knowing for sure, and that there are many epistemological problems. No, that's not their point of view. They literally argue that you cannot know anything about reality itself. No fact about smallpox, no fact about the orbit of the moon, or no fact about your hand in front of your face. According to them, all ideas are by social agreement, not objective truth. They maintain that reason is not a tool for knowing reality. It's all subjectivity. It's all socially constructed reality. This is all kind of confusing, and it's hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, yeah, I'm sure. It reminds me of this term that's come around recently called post-truth. And it was actually the Oxford Dictionary's 2016 word of the year. Um, but I think it captures exactly this postmodernist epistemology that you're talking about or the consequence of that. And so this term, basically how Oxford has defined it is that it's when objective facts are not influential in shaping public opinion and that it's more appeals to emotion and personal beliefs that do. And so the post-truth politics, it's a kind of a culture where debate is framed more by appeals to emotion and it's disconnected from actual policy and using factual rebuttals is not really recognized as a legitimate argument so instead of using facts that's kind of a secondary importance versus using your emotions and your personal beliefs so that's that kind of subjectivity that you're talking about and that social consensus so when I hear this term and I see Ben Affleck, I feel like, oh my gosh, this is exactly this postmodernist thing that you're talking about. Because Ben Affleck, you know, he's not listening to Sam Harris's fact. He's totally overcome with emotion and he feels like he has the right to shut Harris down. But if feelings are always valid and there's no objective reality, then this kind of argumentation that Ben Affleck is demonstrating with Sam Harris I think is a perfect example of the postmodernist epistemology at play that you described. Ah, exactly. If there's no truth and everything's social agreement, if you can't use facts and reasoning, what's left? But moral intimidation, right? Or social pressure, and that's what Affleck's using. You know, the only place left to argue from is from feelings and what are feelings caused by right they're caused by automatic inbuilt processes mystical sources experiences 
or social consensus, like learning from imitation or from social pressure. So in all these cases, feelings aren't grounded whatsoever in facts and evidence. Well, this is where I find it really confusing, because if you can't use reasoning to know reality, and if your feelings are not grounded in evidence, then what's the point of having reasons or justifications for your ideas at all? I mean, why are postmodernists even trying to convince other people that they're right or wrong if there is no fact or thing called truth? Like, how do postmodernists use reasons then? Well, the way they use them is to justify what they're doing. So in their view, all reasons are rationalizations for some ulterior motive, for some feelings, in other words. And the social consequence of this is that no one can be right or wrong, right? If there's, if there's no objective right or wrong, no, no objective truth, and it's just everybody's feelings and whatever you, reasons you're using are just rationalizations for your feelings, then there, there's no right or wrong in the ethical field or the political field. And what, what ends up happening is that all argument and all conflict in society is a mere vying for power. There's, it's not about coming to a reasoned agreement about what's the right way to act. It's just about struggling with each other for who has the upper hand politically. You know, and as, and as Sam Harris has said, if we can't solve conflict by reasoning, the only recourse is violence. So this set of ideas is behind all this violence that's been going on on campus re recently, like Berkeley, where Milo Yiannopoulos appeared, you know. But it's not just the instigators like Yiannopoulos that they're going after. I mean, they're going after people like sober scholars, like Charles Murray at Middlebury College, who was shouted down and the professor who invited him was hurt. And many reason and science types like Sam Harris, they're really perplexed because they think liberalism, which these people claim to be liberals, they think liberalism equals free speech. And free speech is the only way we can have conflict over ideas and values without violence. But ironically, these protesters that con are considered liberals, it's a kind of 1984 new think use of the term because in the age of reason liberal meant someone who was for freedom including freedom of speech but by postmodernist logic Charles Murray's speech because he's part of the so-called power elite his privileged white males etc that his speech is an, is merely an attempt at a power grab and not really an attempt to persuade since persuasion is impossible by by reasoning so he deserves to be shut up with violence. That's the logic behind that. Well, I think that's exactly what Ben Affleck is doing, too. He's just kind of shutting Harris down. And I, I think we're seeing this on campuses at large, that there, there is no room for dialogue. And it's just censoring or ostracizing or removing. But it seems to contradict this desire for tolerance or justice and resistance to oppression because in trying to, I guess, lift up people who are oppressed, they're using force against people who hold ideas they disagree with. So that sounds very intolerant. So it's, it's hard for me to understand how that's being justified. For sure, for sure. And, but of course, you understand that since they think it's all violence, it's okay. I mean, the, the only way to conflict with each other is through power grabs. It's okay for them. But th it's also because they have a kind of 1984 twisting of the meaning of the words liberal and, tolerant, and tolerance. You see, in the postmodernist view, it's violence as response to repressive tolerance. That's why they're violent. They see reasoning as repressive to the less powerful, to the victim groups because reasoning is used by the power elite. So here's the logic. Since all ideas and reasons are tools of power, in other words, emotionally influencing rationalizations, the postmodernists will use anything that enables them to get more power. So to increase their power, these, postmo these postmodernists, they constantly seek to expand the ranks of victims. See, because that allows them to get more power. The more victims they're they're representing the more power they have. And these are against, um, these are victims that are supposedly oppressed by the white majority who are privileged or whomever the privileged are in the society. But here's the stinky part about it. Postmodernists gain 
moral credit and thereby social power because to take the side of the victims appeals to people's sense of fairness, right? That's why they get power. In other words, to people's rational sense of justice. Fairness is from a standard of reason. And so, in other words, it's stinky because they're using the standards of reason to undermine reason. Now, since, according to their view, all reasons are rationalizations for feelings, any negative statement about victim groups or their religions must be motivated by hostile, irrational desires to claim power over that group. In other words, racism. So they kind of use racism as a word to cover all groups um, that are victims because it's, it's the most incendiary word. So this is how any criticism of Muslims becomes racism. I, can you follow that? I mean, it's pretty <laughs> twisted. Yeah, it's really confusing. And it's like the more I think about it, it's it sort of it makes sense. But then it's, it just creates more confusion. So I'm hearing that people may really sincerely be motivated by the desire to protect people that they perceive as victims because they have this rational sense of justice. Um, but then there's this thinking that this justifies the use of violence against people who are the oppressors, who have the power. But if they also believe in, if people have this sense of justice that also includes nonviolent interaction, then there's a contradiction of values. But I also see what is also confusing to me is that there's this concern for the victim and the oppressed groups, where, which are often minorities. But then I'm wondering, so if this oppressed group of victims and minorities then become the repressive majority, then it just seems like who's considered a victim changes and the standard of justice kind of changes with the ebb and flow of the times and who happens to be a minority or who happens to be a majority. So then it's just, you're right, like a situation of power versus a situation of values. So anyone can be right or wrong depending on how much power they have. Exactly. But that doesn't really seem to sit right with me either. No, no, it doesn't. And, and, and it is very contradictory. But just remember that they don't believe that they have to be consistent, right? Because they don't believe in logic and reasoning. Yeah, which is weird. <laughs> but this power and victim framework, the more you talk about it, the more I see how that's the reason why it's okay, why in the postmodernist view, it's okay to criticize some people and it's not okay to criticize other people, even though their actions are the same, in a sense. Like, for example, Sam Harris mentions how people readily condemn Christians or white theocracy um, for their homophobia, but then they're reluctant to denounce other aspects of Islam, which oppress and overtly harm women and gays and make it really unsafe for them or anyone who thinks differently. And in a postmodernist view, because of this framework of power, because Muslims as a whole have been historically considered more as victims or less powerful than whites or Christians, they're less prone to criticism. So if Muslims are the more repressed group under a postmodernist framework, their wrongdoings are less subject to criticism. Exactly. Even if they can be blatantly worse. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You've got it. Okay. So this is, <laughs> I sort of understand it's still really confusing. And I'm wondering how is this connected to colleges? Because universities used to be the place where freedom of speech was really valued and fought for. Kind of like what you said, like li liberalism equaled free speech as a way to resolve conflict peacefully. But now it's a place where censorship, censorship is being advocated. How did that happen? And why are we seeing younger people pushing for censorship when traditionally the younger generations have been the ones that fought for freedom? Yes, it, it seems really paradoxical, right? But, yeah. But I think you can trace it back to the long-term effect of postmodernist ideas becoming the dominant philosophy of uh, intellectuals and professors in the academy. And these ideas, they came out of the ideas of a philosopher named Herbert Marcuse, who was the philosopher of the new left. He wrote, and in fact, if anybody wants to just look up one essay of his that's very influential, it's called Repressive Tolerance, and we'll have a link to that. So Marcuse's idea was 
that the tolerance of opposing ideas and free speech is part of the dominant ideas of the privileged majority. And so therefore, they're oppressive to minorities. To quote him, he said, freedom of opinion of assembly of speech becomes an instrument for absolving servitude. Does that sound a little crazy or what? So fueled by Marcuse's ideas, the student protest got started in the 60s. And that was an attempt. They, so he was influential academically back in the 60s. And at the top universities like Berkeley, Columbia, New York University, Northwestern, these places, the student protests in the 60s got started as an attempt to change our society directly since these students had been tutored under his ideas and fueled with the idea that what was going on in the majority with reasoning, with science, technology, the markets, that was all oppressive to minorities. Um, an interesting example of that is that there was a very famous student leader in the 60s at Berkeley named Mario Savio, and he led demonstrations in the name of free speech. But if you poke into what he was actually doing, you find out that it, it, he wasn't leading a demonstration about a real exchange of ideas as free speech. By freedom, he meant freedom to say anything you wanted, no matter how disgusting or ugly or mean. They were really pushing that. And, and what happened was when the new leftists couldn't change the culture with demonstrations, they started to become violent. So you had the development of a group called the Weathermen with one of the most prominent people being a guy from Chicago named Bill Ayers, who later went into education and became he became a emeritus professor of education at the University of Illinois. And um, they basically took over at the academy. And there's lots of data about that. So just look at Jonathan Haidt's research in The Righteous Mind, which is a book about, it's a very interesting book because Haidt is a liberal who didn't believe this claim. You know, there's a lot of claims on, on the, the part of the right that the left is super dominant in the academy. And he wasn't believing that. So he decided he was going to do some, he was a, a psychologist at, I think, the University of Virginia, and he was going to do research disproving that. And what happened was he found out that they were absolutely right, that the new leftists had taken over the academy and that it was 95% liberal in the sense of left liberal. So now what's interesting is lately they've been using the word progressive to mean this kind of left liberal. And what, what we're calling the current progressives, they're from, also from the new left tradition. So Marcuse's long, had a long-term influence with that article and other things that he wrote, but his article, Repressive Tolerance. And if you want to know more, read him. And also, there's a great essay by philosophy professor George Walsh called Herbert Marcuse, Philosopher of the New Left. We'll put links to that in the research page also. He does an excellent job of talking about Marcuse's ideas and analyzing them. Well, the long-term consequences of all this is that these contemporary demonstrations, these are the ideological children of the New Left, and they are not advocating free speech. And why not? Because, like I said before, they don't believe in the efficacy of reason, of the human mind, of knowing reality. It's all an illusion. It's all subjective. It's all social construction. And if reason is not efficacious to know reality, then only violence is left to settle disputes. So I'm not saying, just to be clear, I'm not saying that all who advocate for victims have this motivation. But it's a red flag when somebody advocates for victims and uses the victims as a club to morally intimidate others. Yeah, that is really worrisome, I think. And it's it doesn't sit well with me because when I think of that, so if yeah, so if violence is the only option left to settle these disputes, to kind of like right the wrongs of the repressive majority, then in that sense, jihadists and Islamic extremists are the true postmodernists, and they're the morally justified ones, and then they're. Their violence is justified because they're a minority and they're a oppressed group that's been discriminated against. Yes, yes. But that sounds crazy. <laughs> but that's exactly the kind of thinking. So since reason and dialogue isn't efficacious, violence is the only way to settle disputes that they have against the white Christian world, which kind of has historically repressed all other peoples. Is that right? Yes, yes. It's little known... But the ideology of Islamism is highly influenced by Western fascism and, and other philosophies from the West. 
uh, just like a lot of people don't know this, but Pol Pot, his terror reign in Cambodia was fueled by what the leftist, uh, by leftist ideas he had learned at the Sorbonne. But even Ben Affleck says that he condemns the actions of jihadists. But under this framework, he should actually be championing them and supporting them. Exactly. You know, and the, these kinds of contradictions, they make people like Affleck very conflicted and very reactive. Yeah, because in one sense, like, you don't want to condone this violence. And, you know, he even talks about, like, the peaceful majority of Muslims in the world as an example of people we should support. But if you're using this victim framework, then the jih jihadists are the true victims. But it all seems to go against this core belief that if re <laughs> because if reasons aren't efficacious, then why is... Ben Affleck even on Bill Maher's show. Like, why does he even think he's right if he's a cisgendered, straight, white American male of all people? Like, what kind of credibility does he have then in this framework? It doesn't really make sense to me because if reasons aren't efficacious, then why is he using them? Well, yeah, the beauty of this set of beliefs is you don't have to pretend to be consistent. So let's go back to what they think. They think all beliefs are rationalizations to gain power. So you can use whatever obfuscations you can figure out to win arguments because it's about gaining social consensus. Whatever emotional tools, whatever social persuasions you can use, that's what you're going to use to get the upper hand. Whatever rationalizations, that's what counts. And it's not whether it's true or consistent. Remember what the communists said, the means justifies the ends. That's what the Bolsheviks said to justify all kinds of mass killings. And that's the same kind of thing today. And, and further on your observations about how self-contradictory they are, notice that their epistemology itself is self-refuting because how can they claim that what they're saying is true if there is no truth, right? Or the, the, their concepts depend on concepts that they deny. And this is what I mean. They create theories, which are complex integrated reasons, and they use those theories to deny the truth of theories at all, of theories even be having any truth. So it's just a, an incredible um, self-contradictory turning on itself obfuscation of ideas. And, you know, the final thing to remember to think about is notice that when they make these claims, they don't live as if they actually believe them. Because, well, I always think about this. If you actually believed that reason wasn't efficacious and you can't know reality, then anything could happen. It doesn't matter, right? It, it's just a, it's kind of just an illusion of social consensus. But do they actually live like that? No. Would they step in front of a moving truck? No, because they don't really believe that it's not real. You know, so then you have to ask yourself, if they don't really live that way and they don't really believe that it's not efficacious, why do they advocate for it? And if they were actually trying to discover the truth, so, so going back to the issue of, you know, it is really hard to know the truth, especially the more, abs we, we can know that my hand is in front of my face most of the time. And you could even argue there's situations in which I could be deluded or have some optical illusion or some brain state where I'm thinking it's in front of my face, but it's not. But in most of the cases, there's many things which we know pretty certainly. But when you get into the more abstract ideas and values and things like that, it's really complicated to figure out the truth. So there's a lot of problems with that. Um, but if people were actually trying to discover the truth, if they were actually trying to discover the truth, wouldn't a more scientific attitude be, hmm, I don't know exactly how reason works, but it obviously can be a very powerful guide to navigating the world. So let's try to figure out how it does that, right? I mean, wouldn't that be the more honest way to approach it? Well, and it seems that's the approach that's used for certain things. But then when it comes to these kind of moral or social issues, then it all becomes up to question. But if they can't live by these claims that they're making, and they're contradictory and self-refuting, then why are they even sticking to them? Like, why even use them? Well, I always ask myself, when someone denies the plain truth in front of your face and gives you a convoluted theory, I ask myself, what is their motive? In other words, what values and what actions do they want but they can't justify? So 
Like I said, there's plenty of epistemological problems to solve, and it's not clear and easy to know in every instant how to determine the truth or what is knowledge. But the plain fact of it is, you and I and billions of other humans are here and we're able to navigate life every day using our reasoning faculties, right? So we know that reason works. And the history of human civilization has been a tremendous progress whenever we apply reason to the problem of existence. I mean, we just look around us today. We're really far from the caves. So why do we have this convoluted denial of the plain truth while using the products of reason, right? While, while using concepts, theories, reasoning, and hearkening to logic. Instead of try, and why not try to figure out how it works? So there must be an ulterior motive. And I think a clue is, if reason and fact-based arguments aren't valid, what's the consequence? The consequence is you can think whatever you feel like. You can value and advocate whatever you feel. All opinions and values are equal. You don't need to justify them. Well, I have to ask, because I guess it's, I'm feeling is that, does everybody have an ulterior motive who is kind of acting in line with this postmodernist ideology? Because it seems like people, like even like Ben Affleck, like I do believe he sincerely cares about people and wants to protect people and wants a place or a society where we're accepting of people with differences. So we're tolerant in some sense. And that we want to validate that people do suffer wrongfully. So what about people like that? Who Do you think that they have an ulterior motive as well? Well, I'm not saying everyone with these ideas has them for an ulterior motive. I think some people are just confused or, go, or going along with the crowd. So, I mean, in that respect, they kind of have an ulterior motive. They want to be accepted. Um, but anyone who uses ad hominem has to have at least a slight feeling of uncomfortableness because it's, it's obviously an attack on the person. It's not an argument, right? It's not a reasoned argument. So, but what I want to go back to, what about this very smart theorist who came up with these ideas? Let's just put aside the people that are following along with the crowd or that are confused using the ideas they actually care about people, but they're using these ideas to justify it. What about the very smart theorists who came up with these ideas? They think they know what they're doing, right? So why do they come up with this theory? And what's weird about it is these types are very consistent in the, in the fact that they're anti-individualist, they're anti-market, they're anti-capitalist, why is that? Why are they all that way? They're anti-science, they're anti-technology. If they were just confused and how we know things, how would all these different people have similar political views, right? I mean, it's a little weird. So I think there's a strong reason to think that they put forth these epistemological ideas in order to gut reason. And the reason they want to do that is so they can push whatever values and goals that they feel are important, regardless of facts or logic. And worse, the entire push to, to shut down free speech, think about it, they try to make speech so hurtful that no one can hear it. It's a strategy to stop people from hearing any reasonable fact-based opinions someone might have. It's a way of getting reason out of the picture entirely. So if someone isn't self-confident of their ability to think and their rightness in doing so, they're very influenceable. So, so influenceable. So here's another consequence of pushing this idea that reason isn't capable. It makes people inconfident of their opinions. They become very, inf you can influence them easily, right? It make them go along with the crowd. They become sheeple. This is a theory that's a great way to make a lot of sheeple. You, and you get to be the leader. So if you're trying to push a, a political agenda or a set of fact, values and ideas that aren't really justifiable, and if you look back at the new left, it's, it was a, the old left had said that they were scientific, but it turns out they weren't, that the communist idea was a big disaster and it just killed human beings and it led to a lot of destruction. It didn't lead, lead to human flourishing. And what leads to human flourishing is capitalism. But if you don't want to believe that, then you have this convoluted set of ideas to still push the collectivist idea that we have to have some kind of socialism. And so in the end, you can, you can look at how Affleck's charge of racism works to undermine Harris and his mission to have open dialogue, right? Calling him a racist makes everything Harris say appear to be questionable before anyone even gets a chance to hear him. 
So that's how it works. I mean, you make the people giving reasoned views seem morally questionable, and then you don't listen to what they have to say, and you go along with the social pressure of what the other, the new left ideas, the ideas that, no, we have to have, be all in groups, and just the whole ramification of it. This also makes me think of the surge in necessary trigger warnings, mm -hmm. that words are so hurtful and ideas are so hurtful that I can't even think about them. I can't even be exposed to them. And it seems to fit in line totally with what you're saying because it does hit this nerve of discomfort when you encounter ideas that challenge your beliefs. But instead of trying to resolve that conflict and really understand, it's just, I can't hear it or people shouldn't have to confront that discomfort because that discomfort is oppressive. And it's kind of, it's really scary when I think about it in that way because it does make people sheeple. And yeah, I think Ben Affleck does demonstrate this because he makes the charge that Harris is a racist. And even though Sam Harris has these polls and facts and he's trying to actually talk about the ideas, Affleck doesn't even address that. He goes straight to Harris as a person that he's racist and he's making these statements and that he's wrong. And so Ben Affleck thinks that Sam Harris's re views are unfounded, even though Sam Harris provides all the reasons and evidence for why he has the beliefs that he does. But I'm confused at what Ben Affleck's justification for his views are. And it doesn't really seem that he provides a reason. He just is very emotional. And the only thing I know for sure about what Ben Affleck believes is that he's uncomfortable about making blanket statements about anybody. But he is so distressed and he seems very threatened by Sam Harris, even though if you look at it, Sam Harris is speaking very respectfully. He's trying to use reasoned evidence. And Ben Affleck is the one who's resistant, is rude, and is shutting him down. Exactly. Harris is a master of reasoning. And he's too good of a role model with too many reasonable opinions. And that's very dangerous for undercutting this irrationalist strategy to get what they want, the power they want. So Harris is a very dangerous person in that respect. He's not afraid to confront rival ideas, you know, uh, or arguments or facts um, that might even negate his own opinions. He, he often brings that kind of thing up. He, he welcomes, he welcomes rival ideas because he's dedicated to knowing the truth. He thinks knowing the truth, that conforming to reality is the only good way to live. So what Harris says obviously counters these postmodernist ideas. And he and everyone like him, they have to be undermined. Oh, excuse me. They have to undermine the idea that reason can't know reality. You know, the facts and his reasoning is too powerful, so they're dangerous. And what happens is these postmodernists, they end up resorting to distortion, deception, and violence to stop him. Yeah, it seems they use their sense of moral righteousness to then oppress other people. I guess what makes me really uncomfortable with these ideas is that, and makes it seem like there's an inconsistency, a serious inconsistency, is that you can then use these ideas to become an apologist for atrocities in the name of tolerance or justice. So in that sense, you're tolerating violence and you can tolerate bigotry or racism because, because it's cultural or it's based on a minority group so that it's all relative. I think a part of why, well, like first this being an apologist for these ideas that really harm people. Another thing that really bothers me is that there's huge social pressure for people to fit into this. And, you know, I graduated in 2010 and I think that I felt I was in a unique department where I felt like I was maybe insulated from this, but I feel like it has gotten so much worse and that students on campus today, I just feel so bad for them because if students want to speak up, it's a very dangerous place for that kind of thinking and speech right now, especially if you don't hold the same views as everybody else. And I I have to wonder, like, do a majority people 
think like this or are a lot of people just afraid and not speaking out because of the social pressure or are these ideas really that per- pervasive? Well, you know, it's hard to know exactly how many people actually think these things, but we know that a lot of them going to college are and, and in academia are influenced by postmodernism. But what we do know is that they're emotionally hijacked. They, they think, I'm a good person because I believe X. Um, they don't want to be a bad person. They don't want to be out with their friends. So they can't let this reasoning affect them. It's too scary. It challenges something they don't want to face. And it's a sad situation because, you know, there's so many supporting and condoning the most horrible cultures because of this relativism. So I, I, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to know. And a lot of times when people get out of um, college, their views change when they go into working and taking care of themselves and being independent. So it's hard to know exactly how many believe it. But then I also hear a lot of these ideas from um, very educated people working in all kinds of fields, in technology, in um, not just not just in academia. This makes me think of our previous episode and thinking in principle, um, just on how powerful ideas can be, and and also how how unknowingly you can be like a secondhand carrier of these ideas. You you even talked about how some of these ideas are derivative of kind of like the means justify the ends of like the communist era and so it just i i hear you talking about how these ideas have originated in academia and how they've kind of influenced our thinking and our dialogue today and our culture today and it's just really amazing and i mean it's amazing because ideas are powerful but that also means they can be used for good or bad and it sounds like this postmodernist ideology is the ideological battle our era is facing today. And I guess I would like to hear what your hope is for our young generation today. What do you think can aid them in this battle? Well, the only solution is a return to reason and objectivity. But the, the good part is that since the facts are actually on the side of reason and objectivity, that's very powerful and it works in people's minds through their natural common sense and their logic. But what's important is that people who are advocates of real freedom and of reason need to clearly call out this pattern for what it is and make no bones about it. You want to say, okay, a lot of people are confused, but let's not mince words about the consequences of these ideas. They're really bad for human beings. They lead to destruction. They lead to confusion. They lead to people being able to be influenced by leaders and, and power lusters. And that's why we're here today. We want to talk about these kinds of things and how to, how people can make their minds clearer so that they don't fall prey to this kind of obfuscation and conceptual confusion. Well, I think that is a great way to summarize our talk today. Thank you all for listening. If you like this podcast, you can support us by leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or even Yelp. And you can tell your friends about it or mention it on Facebook or other social media. And you can always support it by contributions at our website, thegreatconnections.org. Thanks for listening.